Good morning. I want to welcome you to our time of worship today. We come with joy because we're here to praise our Lord. There's just no joy like that. I invite you to stand if you're able and read with me the call to worship. Come with joy and gladness to praise and honor God. Come to the refreshing waters that God provides. God is gracious and merciful and full of compassion. All creation joins us in giving thanks. Give ear, all people, to the law of God. Give thanks for all the guidance God gives us. God upholds all who are falling. God raises us up when we are bowed down. Come, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens. Come, Christ has promised rest. The gentle spirit of Christ invites us. We have come to find rest for our souls. Today we'd also like to welcome our guest speaker, Reverend Fred Weimert, and our guest soloist, Denise Ruffin. Now I'd like to ask you to join with me in singing the hymn of praise, our first hymn, found in the red hymnal, number 51, Creator God Creating Still. Our Old Testament reading today comes from the book of 1 Kings, as found in chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. This is Solomon's request, not for fame, not for riches. He asked for wisdom, and God greatly blessed him with that. 1 Kings 3, 5 through 12. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering judge justice. I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. 
And this is the living word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I'd like to invite you to join with me to sing our next hymn found in the red hymnal number 129, Tell Me the Stories of Jesus. Today I'd like to introduce you all to a good friend of mine from Providence Baptist Church, De Denise Ruffin. Denise and I have been friends for a long time. She was for a long time, I don't know if you were the official treasurer, but you were the person that kept the books for the American Baptist Churches of the South. And when I was the head of the Mission Center, I was so glad to see Denise sitting in meetings because I knew that she would tell me if everything was okay and it would be the truth. Um, in some ways, she reminded me of Ora Altevolt from this church. Ora was the same thing for me. She was the person that would tell me what I could do and what I couldn't do, and Denise is just like that. Um, I've invited her to sing, but I don't want you to think, I, probably like most of you, uh, I grew up knowing African, knowing African American people from the radio, from television, from, uh, from music. Uh, I love the Mills Brothers. I love Nat King Cole and Sammy Davis Jr. I love Motown, um, Stevie and Smokey and all of the people from there. I love the people from Memphis and uh, um, it, just Duke Ellington, big bands, all of those things. Um, but African American people are not just musicians. They're deeply spiritual people. They're my brothers and sisters in Christ. I go to Providence uh, on Sunday morning and I sit and Denise sits right up front because she's the chairman of the deacons. Um, and so I wanted you to hear her pray today. I wanted you to realize she's a part of, she has a spiritual life beyond singing and uh, it's important. When I mentioned a few weeks ago that some of my friends had lost children, one of those friends is Denise. She lost her grandson. 18 years old, I went to that funeral. I will never forget it. Um, I was so moved by all of the young people that came, the people that worked with him. This young man was about to head to college. Um, he was, from all of the reports of his friends, a wonderful example of God's love. And I can't even imagine Denise's loss. I was there because I love Denise. 
and I cared deeply about her and her family. Um, and so I asked her to come and sing, but I also asked her to come and lead us in prayer tonight. So Denise, thank you for being here. Let us pray. Father God, we come into your presence and we ask that you meet us at your throne. God, we come just with open heart tonight to allow you to know that we are grateful that you led us this morning to wake up and see a brand new day that we did not know we would see, but God, because of your grace and your mercy, you have allowed this, and so we say thank you. We thank you, God, for blessing us to stand in the gap for those that have been infected and affected with COVID-19, oh God. We know because of who you are, God, if we just continue to pray, God, and we ask that you wrap your loving arms around our families and those families, oh God, that have lost loved ones to COVID-19. But God, we know that you do nothing but happen chance but you do things sometimes just to get our attention. So we're standing in anticipation, God, waiting for your manifestation to take place. But we ask that God that you will continue to hear our cry. So I ask this morning that you incline your ear to hear from your people. God, we ask that you continue to bless mothers and fathers and families that have lost loved ones not only to COVID-19, but to diabetes and cancer. The ills of the streets of God that we know Satan would love to sift us as we, but God, we know that if we stand in your gap and we stand and we continue to pray for your people who are called by your name, that they will humble themselves, God, and continue to pray. And then only then will you hear the lame. We ask that you bless the congregation of this church we ask that you bless their leadership, oh God. We ask that we will continue, continue, God, to work in your vineyard, bringing those, God, that are lame and sick of mind and sick in spirit, oh God. But they're your children. So God, we ask, oh God, as we come before your presence, oh God, that you will hear us, that you will love us, that you will continue to spread your grace and mercy upon us. So we ask tonight, as you taught your disciples, we pray, our Father, who is art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive others. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you very much, Denise. I can remember Ethel Waters singing that for Billy Graham, um, Crusades, and he did it beautifully. The Hebrew Bible reading for today was the story of Solomon's prayer for wisdom. And the Bible associates Solomon with Proverbs and wisdom sayings I would think that the gospel lesson re relates to the reading from 1 Kings in that Matthew 13 chapter is a collection of parables. Now that word parable comes directly to us from the Greek, but in Hebrew its equivalent is mashal. Uh, and mashal can be translated as a parable, a proverb, a similitude, a wisdom sentence. It is the name of the book of Proverbs in the Hebrew text. At the end of the 13th chapter, after today's reading in the 54th verse and following, we find Jesus teaching in the synagogue back in Nazareth and people, the people's remarks about him were, where did he get this wisdom? Where did it come from? As Matthew, earlier in his gospel, uh, collected sayings about the law, in the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5 through 7. And there shows Jesus on the mountain being both like Moses and also greater than Moses, just in the way he taught. You've heard it said before, don't murder, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, I tell you, you heard that from Moses, but this is what you hear from me. Hate your if you hate your brother, if you lust for another woman, you're just as guilty. Now, here in the 13th chapter, we find Jesus demonstrating himself to be in wisdom, both like Solomon and at the same time greater than Solomon. Solomon's wisdom, while coming from God, focuses on worldly wisdom. Um, while Jesus' wisdom sayings begin, the kingdom of heaven is like, uh, but they don't speak so much of heaven itself as they speak of a different worldview. A major difference between Matthew and the other Gospels is that they spoke of the kingdom of God while Matthew predominantly speaks of the kingdom of heaven. 
I, I love the song that Denise sang. Yeah, and in these times of separation, I especially love those words and long for heaven and home. I find myself longing for home and for family, for a church family here, for a church family at Providence. Uh, I haven't seen my son Andrew and his wife, and the new baby will be here in a few weeks since November. I haven't seen my sisters up in Buffalo since October. I think all of us are longing to see family and home. As for heaven, I could wait a little while longer. I suppose people who I'm not as eager as the people who aren't wearing masks. But, but the kingdom of heaven in Matthew's mind is interesting. He doesn't speak of it as something that is totally otherworldly. Um, now, I fall asleep almost every night watching Perry Mason. And on that channel in the morning, around 5.30 or 6 when I get up and turn the TV on, there's a televangelist on that channel who's currently marketing his new book on heaven. It's full of thoughts about the pearly gates and streets of gold up there in the sky. Who will be there? What will we be like? Uh, this evangelist's belief is that a rewards approach to heaven will cause people to want to do what's right. That was my mother's way, way of getting me to eat vegetables. You eat your vegetables, you're going to have dessert, otherwise you're not. Um, and you'll see in Matthew, Jesus is not given to such speculation. Oh, there is talk of punishment in today's reading, um, but little of rewards. The kingdom of heaven to Jesus is not a carrot that's calling us forward. It is, as he said in his proclamation in the fourth chapter, it's, it's plain. It's a, it's a present reality. It's close at hand. It's come near to us. In the, reading the, in the reading assigned for today, we'll read six of the eight parables that Jesus tells in this 13th chapter. They skip the parable of the sowers and the weeds and wheat growing together. Both of these came with interpretations which were also skipped. But here in the text that the church leaders who wrote the lectionary want us to think about are these words from Matthew 13, 31 to 33, and then 44 to 52. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field, though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed it into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy he went and sold all he had and bought that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he has found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up onto the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets, but threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the wicked from the righteous and throw them into a blazing furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood these things, Jesus asked? Yes, they replied. He said to them, therefore, every teacher of the law who has become a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like the owner of a house who brings out, his store, out of his storeroom new treasures as well as old. Here ends the reading. The kingdom of heaven. It's like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for pearls. The kingdom of heaven is like a net. Uh, then Jesus asked, have you understood all these things? And they replied, yes. Yes. I hated when teachers, who after talking for a lengthy period of time, would ask that question, have you understood everything, Mr. Weimer? Did you get all of that? Now, even on the off chance that I had been listening and heard all of what the teacher said and gotten, not gotten caught daydreaming or 
about mustard seeds growing into trees or treasures being buried in a field. Um, had the teacher asked me this in class, I would have known that the teacher wanted, would want me to say yes. Uh, but I would have also known that that teacher was probably laying a trap for me and preparing to pounce so you do understand how the kingdom of heaven is like a seed, like a yeast, like a treasure, like a merchant's pearls, like a net full of fish. If you understand, then why don't you explain it to the rest of the class? And if I'd have answered no, then the teacher would have given me one of those, why don't you get with the program, Mr. Weimer, looks of dismay. Another thing that we missed in the editing of this 13th chapter of Matthew, along with those deleted parables and explanations, were two segments about Jesus only teaching in parables to the general public. The most challenging of these statements is found in verses 10 through 14, where it said the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, you will be ever hearing but never understanding. You will be ever seeing but never perceiving. This sounds like the God of Exodus, the God who hardened Pharaoh's heart. If God so loves the world, then why would God in Christ have chosen to communicate the message of the kingdom of heaven in word forms that conceal the truth. I have never liked these almost double predestination sounding words of Isaiah to those who have more will be given to those who have not what they have will be taken away. I'm not sure this is the God I want to worship. To prepare for this sermon, I looked through a book by Father uh, John Dominic Crossan, his book uh, In Parables. In the opening of that book, he addresses allegory, parable, metaphor, symbol. He wrote of poets who use these forms, and he began with 13 quotations. Among them, those quotations about poets was this one, a poet's function now don't be startled by this remark, is not to experience the poetic state, that's a private affair. Uh, his function is to create it in others. The man of genius is the one who infuses genius into me. A poet's function is not to experience the poet, poetic state, his function is to create it in others. That's something that's very difficult to accomplish, to make other people feel what you feel. To help you understand this, let me give you an example, kind of a parable of mine. My father, as many of some of you know, was a very good golfer. He was probably among the best golfers in the city of Buffalo for 50 years. And because I was his only son, he wanted me to learn the game as well, and so he sent me to golf professionals to teach me how to swing a club, but the short game, the chipping and the putting, the sand shots, the things that he did so well, the things that made him so good. Most of that he tried to teach me. Now, how can I put this nicely? He wasn't a very good teacher. He, one day it would be, you're moving too much on that shot. You need to be more still. You need to be more still. Three days later, about the same shot, it was, you're too stiff. You need more flow, more movement. I can remember one of those episodes and uh, lessons and returning to Baltimore. And on returning, I talked to Jay Ruhlman, who used to work with me here in the church and also played golf with me. I told him about my frustration with my father's lessons. I said to him, I know that he's just trying to get into my head. And Jay would laugh and say, oh, well, well, that may be true that your father just enjoys getting into your head. 
A deeper truth may be that he simply is trying to teach you what he feels when he hits that shot. Feelings are so very hard to convey to another. In the end of the, para the chapter on parables of Advent, Father Crossan wrote these words. It is one thing to communicate to others conclusions and admonitions based on one's own profound spiritual experience. Uh, it was this that the Pharisaic theology, the theology did so admirably at the time of Jesus. It is quite another thing to try to communicate that experience itself, or better, to assist people to find their own ultimate encounter. This is what Jesus' parables seek to do, to help others into their own experience of the kingdom, and to draw from that experience their own way of life. Guide, guidelines and Levitical laws may make people walk in a uniform fashion, but they do not necessarily create in a person that feeling of what it is to have a heart of love, the true understanding of the kingdom of heaven, thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Father Crossan's chapter on the parables of Advent, he wrote of many of the parables in this 13th chapter, but I was particularly drawn to his thoughts on two of the parables from our text. The one about the pearls and the treasure. Having been an economics major in college, I understand that one could take these two parables in a simply humanistic, business sense way. When you find something of great value, something that is greatly undervalued, you need to free up some capital and snap it up. Because my father's ability to play golf, he was a lifelong country club member. And I, being his son, regularly accompanied him to country clubs. Um, I spent many hours with his very wealthy friends who were well-schooled in the art of the deal. They knew how to procure pearls and underdeveloped treasure troves. Their knowledge increased their wealth, but most frequently their knowledge and their ways were a product of the kingdom of man and not the kingdom of heaven. Uh, what's the difference? When some of my father's friends would find a pearl or a treasure in the field, the art of the procurement um, was the most important thing. And once the treasure was acquired, it was just added to their collection. One more pearl, one more piece of prime property. What's next for my insatiable hunger? With the parables, when the treasure is found in the field, when the pearl is found in the market. There is great joy in that moment, but also in that moment, everything that they had was sold. They risked everything to gain the prize. That's what made these parables of the kingdom, the kingdom of heaven kind of thinking. Father Crossan wrote of the pearl and the treasure. It was from this that all else flowed. And it was this that determined new time and a new history for the discoverer. Most of my father's friends weren't about to risk everything. Like the audience of the prophet Isaiah, seeing they did not see, hearing they did not understand. They were like Ananias and Sapphira in the fifth chapter of Acts, who were selling a piece of property, but in... In selling it, they claimed that they were going to bring and give all the money to the church, and they didn't. They held back a little, a hedge fund. It cost them their lives. It showed a lack of knowledge of life's true value in them. Earlier this month, Judy and I celebrated our 45th wedding anniversary. I can remember, like yesterday, going with Judy to buy her engagement ring. Uh, we went down to Tank's, Ju Tanky's Jeweler in downtown Buffalo. I remember it because of the salesperson who insisted on telling me about how this diamond would appreciate in value over the years. And I wanted to laugh at him. What are you, crazy? 
Didn't you ever hear the Four Seasons? That little chip of diamond on your hand ain't a fortune, baby, but I know it stands for your love. Um, don't you people understand symbolism? What gives this diamond value is Judy and her love and not some future monetary appreciation of a stone. A few years ago, that little chip of diamond came unseated and Judy didn't discover it for an hour or two or a day or two. She tried to retrace her steps to stores and post office, but once a diamond is out of a setting and on the ground, it's just a piece of glass. Um, while that diamond symbolized our promises, it wasn't really crucial to our relationship. What mattered was our love, is our love for each other, for the gift of God that we find in each other. So we went out and we cashed in the old setting and purchased a new ring, a new symbol of our love. Father Crossan also included in his citation of poems, uh, a citation from W.H. Auden's poem, For the Time Being, a Christmas Oratorio, a poem that I read every Advent season. Um, it's the one thing I do every Christmas and Advent season. And I started to look through it, looking for that line, and I found another line that speaks of the kingdom as well. For powers and times are not God's, but mortal gifts from God. Let us acknowledge our defeats but without despair for all societies and epochs are transient details transmitting an everlasting opportunity that the kingdom of heaven may come not in our present and not in our future but in the fullness of time in this time that we're living through right now when time often appears to be standing still when I can't remember what day of the week it is, what day of the month it is. Uh, may we be surprised by the joy that comes in discovering that even in this moment, we can find the fullness of time. Time made full by sharing the love of God, even from a distance with others. I came across some words in a magazine article yesterday by, uh, by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It was from a sermon that he preached around the time of his installation at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. And he said this, remember Christian friends, we are now in the colony of time, but our ultimate allegiance is to the empire of eternity. The empire of eternity. The kingdom of heaven is close at hand. It's within our grasp, our reach. May we reach out for it. May it seize the deepest part of our being. Amen. I don't always give a, a alt, an altar call, but it's important. I saw Dr. Summers give one last week, and I know that uh, Reverend Dorado always does, um, but it is important. It's important for us to choose. It is important for us to recognize that we heard something that stirred our hearts and changed our view of the world and humanity. And it's, you know, nothing is the same. Nothing is the same anymore. So if that has happened to you, I invite you to write to Calvary Baptist Church. I'll send it in my name and I'll write you back and, or maybe call you and we, we can talk about it. I want you to, to sing now in closing hymn number 281, Speak to my heart, Lord Jesus. Speak to my heart, I pray.
I firmly believe that God speaks to everyone's heart. Um, I don't know that all of us listen. None of us listen all the time. Um, but I pray that the message gets through, that you come to understand God's love for you, for all people. Um, in this time, I pray that you'd also show that love. May you go forth full of the grace of God and prepared to share it because the supply is inexhaustible. We will not run out. Go forth to serve God. Amen.